Let's talk about volume in three dimensions and determinants. And uh, this is going to relate to cross products as well. I'm kind of working up to that, but this is, cause should stand alone as talking about volumes in three dimensions and determinants. The, the question is, how do you calculate the volume of a box using coordinates and vectors? And I'm missing a little tiny bit of my screen here. Okay. Um, so we want, we have a, a picture like we have on the right here. We have three vectors coming all out of the origin for convenience. And we make a box based on that. We look at A and we and we move it parallel to itself to line up with C as if we were adding them. We do the same with A and B, B and C. That creates a box, and I've forgotten one of the well, it's one of the copies of C. And I'd like to know how big that is. And basically in terms of these nine numbers, some algebraic formula in terms of those numbers. And you can think about all the geometry that you usually know, and it's not obvious how that's going to apply here when all these guys are slanted. But we can th say some things, like we did in the area video, about what should be true here. So let's write down a few things that should be true. So let's say should have, must have, really, that the volume, let's say V, should be proportional to the lengths of these guys, the lengths of the vector A and B and C. So, so for example, if I double the vector A, or if double C, for example, since I have it copied right now, then I should double the volume. Okay, so I should get a formula that has, when I look at how it depends on C, the C's, the B's, or the A's, and if I double all the C's, not just one, or all the B's, or all the A's, then it should um, double in some obvious way. Okay, similarly for if I triple or quadruple. Um, it should give a very special answer, V equals zero, if any two vectors of these vectors are parallel. This is very similar to the area case. If C comes down and is parallel to A, this vector comes down is actually in this direction, then you're not going to get a box at all. It's going to squash the box and it's all going to lie in a plane. And that's going to have some area but no volume. Okay. So, and in fact, a little more general is that if the three vectors are coplanar. They share a plane. And so they don't actually have to be parallel at all, but if they're just all within a plane. That's a little hard to use as a test, though, because it's a little harder to see. So we're just mainly going to use the fact that if two vectors are parallel, we better get a zero. We saw in the area video that, um, and two dimensional determinants, that that basically forced us to have minus signs in the formula, and that forced us to consider not just the volume, but the oriented, or not the, just the area, but the oriented area. Here, similarly, we're really going to get, we expect to get oriented volume. Now, that's a little trickier to say what the oriented means. In area, it meant counterclockwise rotation versus clockwise rotation. And we'll get a sense for what the orientation means eventually. What it does mean is that if I switch any two of the vectors a, b, c, then I expect to get a minus sign. Now that's weird if that's if I really, really just wanted area, or volume rather, and not oriented volume, but we should expect by analogy from the area that we're actually going to get oriented volume. Okay. So here I'm just going to give you the formula. And in fact, I even pre-wrote it because I didn't I want to be able to write it accurately and quickly and while talking. Well, and while talking, that would have been hard. Okay, so let me just delete some of this blank stuff. All right, that's good enough. Okay. The determinant of a 3x3 three three matrix is exactly the official name for the oriented volume. So this volume, the oriented volume, is called the determinant, just like it was, just like oriented area in two dimensions is called the determinant for a two by two matrix. This is really what the determinant means. I think it's the best way to think about the determinant 
and give it some meaning as opposed to just some weird formal calculation that happens to be useful. The two notations are just like in the area case. You can change to single vertical bars, but that kind of looks like absolute values, and it makes you think it's positive, which it isn't. Or just put a debt in front of the matrix. And um, here's three versions of the formula. One, these two versions, here's one, two, and three. The first two versions let a, the A's play a special role. And that's often how people uh, calculate this. Um, and it relates to a lot of properties of determinant that I'm not going to really focus on in this video. But what we do is we take A1, and then we multiply it by something that should look a lot like a 2 by 2 determinant. And in fact, it is. It's the 2 by 2 determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix you get when you cross out the row and the column that A1 live in. Then you take A2 and you do something similar, and A3 and something similar. There's something a little weird here, though. A, let's go to A3. A3, if you cross out that row and that column, you get the ones with B1, C, B2, C1, C2. This is exactly the determinant. Ooh, that's a 2. It's exactly the determinant. There we go. So much for doing it carefully beforehand. This is the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, That's called a minor. But here, I don't actually exactly have the determinant. Here, I would want to take uh, take the row that A2 lives in and the column out, and I would get B1, B3, C1, C3. This is actually minus the determinant. It's, going the, it's, it's done in the opposite order. So that's reflected here, that where we actually let all these guys be exactly the determinants of those matrices when we crossed out the row and column, and we put in an artificial minus sign here. And I, I like to call it the secret minus sign. Um, there's more to be said about secret minus signs and things like that, but what this is called is called the cofactor expansion of the determinant. And I'm, I'll, I'll save it for a different video to talk more about that and just do examples. Um, right now I'm interested in why on earth this would give the right geometry. I want to go back to this formula one more time though. There's a reason for writing it this way that we'll see later. And it's actually just as easy to memorize in this form because all you do, all we're doing is we're taking A1 and then we're looking at the B's and C's and we're just not using the subscript 1. We're just not using the first component of that those vectors. And we're making sure that 1, 2, 3 for the positive 1 is in order and 1, 3, 2 is out of order. Now wait, how does that apply to this? Well, 2, 3, 1, is that in order? Yes, it's in order if you put 1, 2, and 3 around a circle. This is called cyclic order. Let's see if I can squeeze it in here. Um, if you put the numbers 1, 2, 3 in a little circle, then positive means going that way around the circle, negative means oppositely around the circle. So 2, 3, 1 is, does deserve to be positive, and 2, 1, 3 is backwards. That's going this way, so that gets a negative. So that actually leads to the last formula, which is just the same terms, but just reordered a little bit. It's focusing on which ones are positive and which ones are negative. What it emphasizes is that it's every single way of writing down A, B, C, and then putting three different numbers as the, the subscripts. So it's the first component of A times the second of B times the third of C, or first of A, third of B, second of C. All six ways. There's six ways to do that. And if these guys are in cyclic order, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2, you get positive. Or if it's not in cyclic order, 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, or 3, 2, 1, those get negative. And it's this last one that makes it clearer that it's going to have some of the properties that we want. It's more symmetrical in A, B, and C here. So for example, if I double A, all the A's, well that's going to give a, a factor of 2 in every single term, and so it's going to double. If I triple B, it's going to give a factor of 3 in every single term, and so it's going to triple. So it has that property of scaling that we desperately need for a volume. Okay. Um, what about the sw the sign switches. Well, if I switch the A's and the B's, for example, then A1, B2 switches with A2, B1. And A2, B3 switches with A3, B2. And A3, B1 switches with A1, B3. So that's going to switch the signs as well. And what about the zeros? Well, um, if you have B and C being equal. So B2, C3, well that's matched up with B3, C2. If B and C were, the, were equal, that would, those would be the same combination. So A1, B2, C3, if the B's and C's don't matter, then that's going to be the same as A1, B3, C2.
Similarly for the other terms, they're all going to cancel and you get zero. Okay, So this automatically, even though it's a weird complicated formula, has the properties that we want so far. And it has some other very desirable properties. I could have said is one of our things we must have. Very simple thing. If the thing is a rectangular box, everything is a right angle, with side, let's say it's A00, zero, zero, and then 0B0, zero, zero, and then 0C. Zero, zero, well, that had better be equal to ABC. So is that true? Well, using any one of these formulas, let's let maybe go back up to this one. If I have A, I take A, and I blank out that row and column, and I just take the determinant of B00C. Zero, zero, that certainly gives me BC. So I take A times BC, and I get ABC. All the other ones die because they have a contribution from this row, this in the first row, or this in the first row from either one of these versions of the formula. A2 and A3 are 0, so these guys all die. And I just get the ABC from here. And so rectangular box does work. That's the picture. If I take this picture and I just look at a simpler box, where it's exactly along an axis there, along the axis here, and along the axis here, and it's just a nice rectangular box. I certainly know that that should be a simple case, and I should just get A times B times C, length times width times height. So hopefully that makes it somewhat plausible that uh, this formula actually makes sense. Now, it's been a lot of letters. Let's just do one numerical example that's a little bit more random and then we'll save the rest for, uh, for another video, especially how this connects with the cross product. So let's do the determinant. Let's say this is like 2, 3, minus 5, 4, minus 2, oops, 1, 0, 4, 7. Now, there's various ways of calculating the determinant. The idea that the row A is special, hopefully you've kind of guessed already that that's not very special based on, for example, this formula. But right for this particular example, there's no reason not to treat it as special, a little bit special. So we're going to get 2 times, now we black out the row in that column, and we get minus 14 minus 4. Minus 14 minus 4. Then, secret minus sign times the 3, and that's to make all the cyclic order stuff work out, times the determinant of 4017. Black out this guy and this guy. And so that's 28 minus 0. And then plus, ah, plus a negative number though, minus 5 times, uh, let's see, there we go. So you can see it plus, because there's no secret minus sign anymore, a minus 5, and then 4 times 4 is 16, and then again minus 0. And we're going to get um, minus 18, so minus 36, and then minus 84, and then minus 80. Wow, it's a pretty big negative number, which is minus 200, in fact. Okay. And so that's an explicit example of calculating a 3x3 three three determinant. But as, it, as I said, um, if you continue with the next video, I'll say more about the geometry of this and then lead into connecting that with the cross product in three dimensions.